Hey, Money Guy family, have you ever wondered how you stack up? How do you turn income into wealth? We have all your answers and more today because we have the author of The Next Millionaire Next Door, Dr. Sarah Fala. It's Brian Preston, The Money Guy. So, Bo, this one, I, here's what's crazy. I want everybody out there, Money Guy family, I am so excited about this show because we've, we've been working on getting this set up. But then, wouldn't you know, today is the day that we're burning it at both ends. I mean, we, I had two client meetings. We had two Ask the Money Guy segments we recorded. And, Sarah, I have I, – these show notes are four pages, which is pretty, oh, yeah. pretty lengthy for, for a Money Guy show. So I'm going to, you know, try to keep this thing together and make sure that we represent you well. But I, I just want you to know that this is going to be a special one. If, if you're looking for – Hall of Fame type things of, of what we could do content on for the Money Guy Show. It's this. And thank you, everybody who's out there on both YouTube and Facebook on the live side, if you're watching this live. But those who are catching this on Friday and afterwards, thank you for coming. Because this is, here's what I'm hoping you guys get out of this. When Sarah continued the legacy of her father, and I'll get into that mm -hmm. in a minute, um, you know, I asked you, Sarah, in the interview, I said, what do you kind of want people to get out of you coming on the show? And you, your big takeaway was you wanted people to know they can do it. Mm -hmm. Don't let the voices, don't let the other people tell you that this this dream of becoming wealthy and successful is, n is not possible. Is that kind of what's driven you to kind of come back and, and, and look at this and continue your father's legacy? Absolutely. I think that just, you know, that, that idea that, um, that, that you can't do something or that you can't achieve financial or economic success is something that um, we, we've continued to see it's just not true. And that by, you know, using certain behaviors and, you know, really having certain habits, you can achieve financial success. So no, absolutely. That's, that's why I wanted to continue this and, and finish this book that my father and I started. Yep. Well, you can tell that I'm not a professional because I, I immediately ask you a question before I give you an official proper <laughs> introduction. So, so let me, I, I do want to bring yeah, right. you in, yeah. no, but, but, but I think it's important for people to understand because we have a lot, here's what's cool about the Money Guy family. We have listeners and viewers of all ages. So I think there's a whole group of people, probably especially out there in YouTube world, that they are discovering our content and they're kind of, and especially part of this fire movement where they're energized, mm -hmm. where this is, this is the content they come to kind of fuel up their gas tanks or batteries, if you're a Tesla person like me, you know, so that you, you feel energized to move forward. And I just want people to know the journey I've had with the content that your father created and now you've continued his legacy. And I, I, I told you as we were coming live, these are some of my biggest keepsakes, you know, because Sarah, you and I have some history in the fact that I started doing the show in 2006 and then Tim reached out to us, was that 2010? Ah, uh, yeah, that's it. Was around 2011, 2011 or 12, maybe. Yeah, yeah. it was right around yeah. there. So yeah. Sarah reached out. I can't. I, I can't remember how you were doing some data research or other things. So we went and had lunch up in Atlanta, and you were yep. so nice that you actually brought two signed copies um, of the Millionaire Next Door, of course, which is one of the you know it's just an incredible resource, and then the Stop Acting Rich. By the way, I could probably turn around and show you that I have an unsigned copy because I already own both of these books, multiple <laughs> copies of both of these. But here's what I want my young listeners to know: In 1996, I can still remember I, me and I had my buddies from high school when I came home for breaks from college, and even after I graduated college, super close knit group with my high school guys. And, you know, and back then, this is back when Barnes and Noble and Books a Million and the bookstores actually existed still. Right. You didn't just buy everything on Amazon. Right. So we were, right. you know, kicking it at, at a bookstore. That's how cool we were. And, and I, I really kid you not, I just stumbled, stumbled across this book, The Millionaire Next right. Door. And I can remember, you know, because that's the year I graduated college. And I can't remember if it was right before or right after I graduated, but I was reading it right as I was leaving, the, you know, leaving college and starting my work career. And I read it, and I was like, holy cow, this is all the stuff. Because remember, I, I tell you guys all the time, the first aha moment was that economics teacher I had in high school, the, the military guy that was now the wrestling coach, but then was, you know, in his spare time from coaching 
and other things was teaching economics. That's what, you know, I don't know right. that, that was his priority, but, <laughs> but he, um, he told us this statement, if you saved a hundred dollars a month, you could be a millionaire. So that was my first, wait a minute. I worked at Hardee's. Mm-hmm. I can do this. And then when I found your father's book, Sarah, it just, it opened something up inside of me where I, it really turbocharged my, my desire to want to save and build and turn exactly what you said, turn income into net worth. Because so much of what's going on out there in popular culture is they try to talk about this flashy wealth of buying big houses, big cars, Mm -hmm. big lifestyle. But as you so eloquently talk about and your father talked about, is that that's not actual wealth. That's not even net worth. That's just you spend. You right. make a lot, you spend a lot. That's income rich. That's not balance sheet mm-hmm. rich. So that's that's what I'm hoping. And, and I would even say that th- your father's book was probably has its fingerprints on the FIRE movement. And, and for those of you who are older and don't understand, financial independence, retire early right. is really, it, it is all the rage. I mean, people are talking about it because I think there are a lot of people that are trying to figure out how do they do it fast and often and early mm-hmm. so they have flexibility and options in, in, in the future. So I want to kind of now, after I've given you the, the intro of your father, I want to mm-hmm. talk about you because when you and I sat down in 2011, 2012, whenever it was, I want people out there in our audience to know you had an interest in this already. You already were a doctor, mm-hmm. um, you know, had your doctorate. You already were doing the research with your father because this was going to be a collaborative team effort on y'all's part. And then, unfortunately, in 2013, your father tragically, w- w- you know, passed away. He was in a car accident with, yep. I believe, a drunk driver and, yep. um, and, and tragically took him away. But this was not something where you picked up the mantle of his work after the fact, because you want to continue the legacy, you actually have your own chops. I mean, you're you're a bulldog, <laughs> which we all know that makes you brilliant that's because right. that's what there you go. you're in great that's company. Right. Um, so, I mean, tell tell us. But what I want to do is kind of talk about and bring this back to you. Is that this book, your book, was an incredible capstone? I think your father would be so proud because as I was reading it, it what it, what I thought was brilliant about it is that it updated all the data. So if you if you're one of those people that thinks that what your father, Dr. Thomas Stanley, said can't be true because it was 1996 and that was just mm-hmm. once in a lifetime. You dispel that and blow that up <laughs> tremendously in your book. And then, so so it's great that it gives updated data, but then it also is a capstone in the fact that it comes and pu- pulls really cool stories mm-hmm. from The Millionaire Next Door. It pulls really cool stories from Stop Acting Rich. Um, it also brings in your dad and you wrote had a blog um, that carried on for many years that you were yep. able to pull excerpts from. So I've kind of set the stage now. Is there <laughs> anything else? I mean, what else? Because, you know, what else kind of drove you? And, and give us kind of a, a, a walk through the process so we can then give everybody the steps to turning income into wealth. Yeah. So one of the things that I started doing, you know, like you said, back in 2011, 12 or so, was looking at those characteristics. So I'm a psychologist. That's my background. I'm always wanting to know what kind of characteristics are going to make someone successful. That was what I did in my previous life um, and companies. And so now I, we, you know, started begin, or rather I began looking at how people manage their household lot, you know, financial life, if you will, like a job. And so who's good at that job? Who, you know, what kind of characteristics, you know, allow somebody to be really successful at budgeting and saving and investing, or even hiring a professional advisor, those kinds of things. And so I took the research that my father started again, back in the, you know, 70s and 80s and and through to the 90s and, um, and began looking at those factors. What were the characteristics? What were the similarities? And so that sort of led to, uh, you know, the, the research that you see in The Next Millionaire Next Door, where we talk about the fact that not only is it, you know, just millionaires that have these certain behavioral traits, but it's also individuals that are on their way to becoming millionaires. Exactly so right. if you're frugal and, and um, you know, you're able to ignore what everybody else is doing around you, you're better equipped to, you know, again, transform income into wealth. And so, you know, that was kind of the journey. We began it together, certainly, like you said. Um, yeah, we were about to send the survey out. It was actually 2015. Um, and, uh, you know, he passed away, but, you know, it needed to continue. I think people started mentioning that, you know, the millionaire next door is dead and this, this idea 
idea that that you can do this today just isn't possible. And and that you know that was definitely some fuel to to continue the work and make sure it com- was completed. Um, took a little while, but um, you know it's it's out now. And um, yeah. You know, one of the things that I'm <clears throat> sort of curious about, Sarah, is a lot of folks came out, uh, and, and n- not that they were critical, but they said there were some unique things about the time period in which... No, they were critical. Okay, well, Brian's going to yeah, go, go ahead and say it. Let's, yeah, let's so, go ahead and get the, let's get the trolls out. So there, there were some critics who, who said there were, uh, you know, there were some unique things that uh, either with that time period or how the data was collected. Was there any part of your desire to kind of finish this and write this book and put this out there? Was some of that, you know, you wanting to set the record straight for a lot of the naysayers who say, no, 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 the moon next door, that's not a real thing. That, that's not, that was a once in an era thing. That was an internet.com, you know, right. an internet thing, right. yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, just to your point that you raised before, tell that to the fire community, you know, the idea that you can't do this and you can't do it quickly and, and effectively if you really, um, you know, are, are really focused on it. Um, absolutely. So, you know, again, going back to some of the research uh, that we've done at data points at my company, we've looked at um, different groups of individuals. Those same behavioral traits are the ones that allow them to be successful. Um, so it doesn't matter if we're talking about millions millionaires, again, or, or people on their way. So definitely worked, you know, part of the work that I was doing was to understand really what those key factors were and what could transcend sort of time. And that's part of what we talk about in the book. One of the things I think, because uh, I'm ready to jump in and let's even talk about the portrait of what the millionaire next door looks mm-hmm. like in the mm-hmm. current, currently mm-hmm. what's going on. But listen to this stat that I saw, and you, this is in your book, Sarah, was in 1996, there were three and a half million, millionaire households. Mm-hmm. That was about three and a half percent of the population in the United States. Mm-hmm. In 2017, this is what I think blows the critics up. This is the part where, because everybody's always telling you, no, you can't do that. You know, because I think mm-hmm. there's, it's a coping mechanism. Why do we watch The Bachelor and Bachelorette? It's because we like to see dysfunction because it makes <laughs> us feel better about our own relationships. It's the same thing when you, you're a critic, I think, in the financial world, is that you like to poke holes when somebody gives you the roadmap to success because if you have any failures in your life, it gives you a great coping yeah, helps you to cope. say, right. hey, uh, you know, of course you can't do it. The system's stacked against you. That, that's, that's why people do that. It's so much easier to fall on the negative side of things right. than to actually find the, the, the path forward, the positive side of things, the glass half full. Mm-hmm. But here's the stat. So three and a half million households in 1996. 2017, that number's 11 and a half mil- millionaire households, 9% of the population. Now, a lot of you guys are going to say, well, inflation. Well, we all know it's, there's a reason that the over 3% wage inflation we're seeing now is getting so much, you know, people are talking right. about and stuff. We haven't had as much increase of things. Mm-hmm. And I think, Sarah, you even showed in your research, 1 million in 1996 is now the equivalent of what? One and a half million, according to your research? Like yep. Yep. So okay. it's... That number is phenomenal. How many more? Yeah. And that's why it's not a zero-sum game. You can do this, guys. It's not like somebody has to lose for you to become successful. You can, right. if you follow these steps and you talk about these things. We just did that show, Sarah, on the habits of the successful. And we used a portion of your, I think it was page mm. 159, where I was just talking about how millionaires spend their time. You have the time. page numbers memorized. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> that is Sarah, remarkable. I hung out with this book. I don't even have book. the page numbers memorized. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I've been yeah. hanging out with your book, if you, if you can't tell. <laughs> hey, but it, just so you know, if you, if you are somebody out there, because what's fun, so funny is there's a live chat going on in YouTube right now. If you haven't had a chance to watch us live on YouTube or Facebook, there's a live chat feature. I'll a lot of folks are saying, "Hey, I, I'm going to add this. Uh, I'm going to add this book to my purchase list. I'm going to add it to my reading list. I can't wait to jump in." Uh, that's awesome. We're, we're actually going to give away some of these books yeah. too. So hang in there. And if you, by the way, anybody and I'm, Lisa, I hope that's our content manager. I hope I don't screw this up. Everybody who, I mean, I want you to sign up. Give us your email address, and we plan on doing of the. Uh, we plan on doing of everybody who's on our subscriber list. I don't want to alienate our people who are existing mm-hmm. email subscribers, but everybody who's part of our email list, we're going to do some some raffles and give away at least ten of these books. So I want you if you if we don't have your email address, what are you doing? Get us your email address so you can have a chance of getting a free copy. Oh, we all love free. Free is good. Free but is good. Let's go into the portrait of a of, of, of millionaire next door because um, I thought this was great. And, and just because I'm nerdy and I'll tell you. And look, I want you all to know 
I'm going to be giving away a lot of the stuff I saw in Sarah's book. And Sarah's seen my notes, so she knows I'm not giving away. But it's only probably a tenth of what's actually in this book. So I don't want you to think, well, I don't need to go buy the book because Brian just gave me all the, the thoughts. That is not the case. <laughs> no, you still need to go buy the book. Still Sarah, to... isn't that right? <laughs> no, I just don't want, because Sarah's been so generous letting us talk about this. I don't want you to get the wrong idea with this. But I do think it's important to look at what does the portrait of million, mm-hmm. the millionaire next door. And this is part... And this is going to sound counterintuitive at first, but but I'll let um, Sarah kind of give some color to it. We're mostly 61-year-old men who either married or remarried. More than 80% of us believe our spouses are critical factors in our economic success. And by the way, I left out some stats there. So 87% are the the mostly 61-year-old men. 87% are married, I should say. 69 in their first marriage, and then 25% remarried. Mm -hmm. So what is, I mean, that age, is, should people be put off by that age any, Sarah? I mean, what, what are we supposed to t- think out of that? Yeah, no, you know, this again, um, if you look in the in the back, we kind of describe how the data was collected and the sampling and, and all of that. Um, no, this is, this is just um, kind of when, um, you know, the age piece here is more of, of a sampling issue. So think about, uh, think about the fire community. If we did the same kind of study with individuals like that, it would be a very different number. Um, but I think this is c- pretty consistent when you look at other studies that look at affluent individuals. Um, you know, we've had questions about, well, why are there so many men? And, you know, I can't really answer that question sure. because mm-hmm. they were, you know, random kind of, uh, again, sampling. Um, and we asked for the individual that was, you know, kind of in charge of managing the household finances to complete the survey. So for, for better or for worse, that's, that's, you know, what we ended up with. I I, brought, I pointed out the age because I I thought one of the, my takeaways. Now this is you tell me if I, I've blown it and gone and left field somewhere. <laughs> but one of the things that would be so unlikely. Well, no, but, but, but one of the things I think I pointed out that age is because and not to to be Debbie Downer on people that these people mm. are a bunch of old men, old, you know, old guys that have the money. Is that it does take a while to build wealth. I think mm-hmm. so much in society is put out there that you got to be, as your father so so well put it, is you have to be like Mick Jagger or sign a big, hit the lotto or, or, or sign some right. big baseball contract. That's not how most millionaires get it. Right. Most millionaires get it by the principles we talk about on the Money Guy Show and what you have in your book is that you start early, you save often, mm-hmm. and you just consistent. And then one day you wake up and you realize that army of dollar bills has turned into something pretty spectacular, right. but it right. does not happen over night. Yeah, um, absolutely. So so here's another point I wanted to point out. Our medium, median income in the previous year was 250000 Our median net worth is $3.5 million. Compared to the average American, we earn four times as much. Okay, that's a leg up. Mm-hmm. I, I understand that having four absolutely. times as much income. Yep. But listen to this. While our net worth is 36 times the average. So yes, their income is up, but you think about that, the exponential difference between income, their net worth versus income, that means that they're really good with their resources. Right, yeah. That, yes, they make a good income, but they're also really good at making sure things are falling in the right spot. Um, go ahead, Sarah. No, I was just going to say, absolutely. I think it, it goes back to some of the things we'll probably talk about later, including, you know, just the, the basics like budgeting and planning and knowing what's going on in your financial life, being aware, those kinds of things um, are, are really what we see that differentiate individuals that are successful at this versus those that, you know, have to struggle with it. Sure. Um, here's another one, because this is important. And then I have a follow up question on this one. Uh, is, yep. Education has been critical to our success. More than 93% of us have at least a college degree, and nearly 60% of us have a graduate degree. A little more than half of us attended a public college. Huh. There's so much to unpack in yeah. that. Now, it yeah, really it, is. And there's definitely, this is definitely a piece that was different from 1996, right? So there were, you know, m- much fewer in, term, in terms of graduate uh, folks, or folks with a graduate degree in the millionaire next door. So that clearly has changed over time. Mm-hmm. The the need or the the desire, if you will, to have that graduate degree. Um, but I, I don't think that what it means is you have to have a graduate degree to be a millionaire. Um, it, it probably doesn't hurt, depending on what industry you're in. But um, you know, and certainly if it means taking on tons and tons of debt and having to live with that for for years and years after that. Um, it, it may not be worth it, Likely but that's sending just... you in the other direction. Well, you know, and that, that's, yeah. I wanted to point out the point that 
a little more than half, so that's over 50%, attended a public college. So, and there's nothing wrong with private schools. I'm not picking on private schools, but I want people to know because part of what we try to tell our listeners is before you go build up a ton of student loan debt, make sure you have that, that whole covey of begin with the end in that's mind. Right. Yep. If you know you're going into something maybe that doesn't generate a ton of income, but is very fulfilling to you, maybe, you know, Look at public versus private when you're figuring out student mm-hmm. loan exactly as well right. as where you should go to school. You need to think about where your place is because I do get – I'm amazed at how many people go to super expensive private schools for sometimes majors that more than likely are not going to generate a ton mm-hmm. uh, of income if you follow that that, that professional. Sure. So it is definitely something to put in there. And then one th- – here's my follow-up question for you, Sarah. And yep. I know we have to keep moving is that – <laughs> You're, you know, I used to talk about with the millionaire next door is that I used to play the Willie Nelson song of um, let no mama don't let your babies grow to be cowboys, cowboys. Okay, let them yeah. be doctors lawyers you know that's what the song his song is yeah. is that and, and there was a whole research section on most second generation wealth is people go into service type architects attorneys okay. accountants right and att- right. is that still the case i mean is i mean just getting an update from 1996 to 20 you know where here we are in 2018 is that what your research still showed yeah so we we didn't look at the sort of ethnicity and kind of first generation pieces within this survey but we do continue i mean you continue to see this if you look at other research that's out there that individuals who are sort of second generation, um, you know, the, the parents who maybe have immigrated here, they're, they're pushing their children to being into those, again, those kind of service professions or, you know, professional careers like attorneys and doctors and things like that. So I think that that's, that's a pretty consistent pattern over time. Um, I'm going to go through these because I know we could do a whole show just off of this list. And I know you're looking <laughs> at me going, how are we going to get this all in? So here's, well, here's one, because this shows how much is first generation. This is a key point. We live off of what we've made as more than 86% of us had zero of our income from trusts and estates in the previous year, and only 10% received any gifts of cash, securities, properties, or vehicles from relatives. That point, in a very fancy way, Sarah, says these people are, are somewhat self-made, That's or right. at least they, they're first generation. Is that, is that a true statement? Yeah, so it's, what it's saying is that their income isn't coming from some trust fund, you know, where, where we, we – you know, might perceive that that wealthy people have these you know secret funds everywhere. That's not really the case, and that that's consistent over time. Um, so that's one that that we've seen you know again consistently throughout the studies that have been done. And, and then this one here's something because this is an echo of what we see on a daily basis with our money guy family as well as clients of abound wealth. Listen to this one: We are frugal and we budget. A full 70% of us know how much we spend on food, clothing, and shelter each year, and 59% of us have always been frugal. More than 60% of us consider frugality as a critical factor in our success. Sarah, we have people who come to us. Part of what we are hired to do is help them actually feel okay about spending. To help them flip the switch. To to flip the switch from saver to spender because that is such a hard thing to do. And I will tell you, a lot of our clients, as well as our, our, our you know, our audience members, we get spreadsheets uh, of, or quicken, quicken reports, you know, of what they're tracking. And this stuff is professional grade. I mean, it's, it's not even amateur level. It's truly amazing. So, so you, and you've mentioned that frugality mm-hmm. already. Uh, here's yep. something I wanted to get your take on. Mm-hmm. The most we've ever spent on jeans is $50. On a pair of sunglasses is $150. And a watch is three hundred. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Can you give us some? I mean, let's talk about the behavior of these people. You know, what, what's some interesting things you figured out? Yeah, you know, I think when we when it comes to those, those were three categories that hadn't been asked before. So we included those. We talked about why kind of that designer gene, you know. Um, piece had, hadn't been asked before, but we felt like it was important because in the past, you know, he had asked questions about suits and things like that. Right. Well, who wears suits anymore, right? To, yeah. to the office. So, <laughs> Look at um, us. Yeah. So, so, um, so we included that and I, I, I thought that was fascinating. I mean, I know I have friends who spend well in excess of $50 for a pair of jeans and, you know, probably shouldn't be. Um, and, and so I, I found that pretty fascinating. I will say that 
some um, readers and fans of my dad's work have written in to say, are you sure that's right? Because that does not sound right. That sounds way too high. And, and <laughs> you know, so I, I thought that one was particularly fascinating. Well, and, and what a lot of the research shows is that you will find quality does play into sure, account sometimes. Yeah. Sure. Um, one of the things, and I know we're doing this a little out of order, but I want to keep things rolling, is that you had talked about, like, and it's been in some of your father's research too, like watches. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. is that people, and I, I'm curious to know what impact is like the Apple Watch going to have on those behaviors? Because I feel like, you know, the Rolex and the, you know, the Omegas and the Tags and those type of watches, I don't know that rich people necessarily... Go after those go as after much that as, as much did. as I know the younger generation would rather have an Apple Watch. Sure. Probably is that I mean did that I don't I'm just throwing that on you, Sarah. But did that yeah. come up? You know, it, it hasn't come up too much. Um, but what we do again, what we've seen and and even in working with um, and talking to companies that kind of resell watches, right? So like the really fancy watches, secondhand. Um, you know, a lot of people want to continue to emulate what they think wealth looks like, and so for that reason, those kinds of watches will continue. But I think you're right. I think as technology continues to be, you know, something that you have to have on you, those those Apple watches will continue, and so that may be why. You know, again, I think it's um, there's a little difference. I think it's a little bit lower in terms of the median price paid by um, uh, millionaires on watches has decreased over time. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think that that will continue. Um, I feel honored that we have you on here as a guest because we can we can talk about this. This is something that we've covered on the show. One of our most popular series we've done, Bo, mm -hmm. when we went on YouTube was what your net worth should be by right. age. And, you know, there's the whole expected net worth formula that, that your father had that was the, yep. it was you take your age times income times 10% was your expected net worth. And then the, you could take this number, this calculation, and a lot of people are right now scribbling down on a sheet of paper to figure <laughs> out where they fall. But here's the challenge is you're trying to get at least two times your expected net worth because that would make you a prodigious accumulator of wealth. And that's the one you want to Yeah, be. that's the one. That's the one when you hit that, you get the gold star for, for being <laughs> awesome right. at building assets <laughs> because there's a multiplier effect that comes from that versus the under accumulator, meaning that mm. when you do that formula – and you come in lower, that means that maybe you're not devoting the resources you should. But you and I, I want to talk to you because we've we've given a lot of credit to these fire people out there mm -hmm. saving early. What advice do you give people who are, say, under 45, who do that formula and they feel like it's a little skewed? Yeah, you're, you're right. And it, and it is. It uh, overestimates kind of where you should be, because if you take your net worth and you subtract your expected net worth, especially if you're under, you know, 45, maybe even under 50, it, it sometimes, you know, uh, underestimates, or I should say overestimates where you should be. Sure. Um, so, you know, again, I, I think it just goes back to ensuring that you're emulating the behaviors that actually lead to wealth and not focusing so much on where other people are. I think we say this a couple of times in the book that there's not one path to financial independence. Um, you know, your path is going to look really unique. It's great to learn kind of how other people have done it. But at the end of the day, you have to make your own decisions about you know, what's, what's right for you and the goals that you have. Um, so that's, you know, something to keep in mind as well. But, you know, so, so for those that, again, you know, feel like that wealth equation is, is, you know, freaking them out, um, we would say, you know, it does take time, like you mentioned earlier, uh, and, you know, to continue to emulate those, those good behaviors that will allow you to, to achieve financial success. And, and Bo, we, that's one of the things we talk mm -hmm. about is that if you sometimes you can't control where you came from, right. but you yep. can say have a goal of saving fifteen to twenty yep. percent of your gross income. And I know you know the twenty two year olds out there listening go fifteen percent. That seems a little harsh. If it's not fifteen percent, start with five. But every year as you get pay raises, take it up to six, take it up to eight, take it up until you get to that fifteen to twenty percent. We understand that this is a journey, and that's why I kept coming back when we went through that portrait. If it says that the that the average millionaire is in their 60s right. potentially, but then most of them are even hitting it in their, to their 50s, it gives you guys just a little more perspective of where you are so that you don't lose, let right. somebody tell you you can't do this right. because you just need to have a realistic understanding. And here's, let's, let's destroy this wealth myth even more. Um, 
And Sarah, what was in 1996, what percent of millionaires were first generation? Right. So in 96, um, it was 80 percent approximately. So they were, um, you know, they, they did not have any wealth that came from relatives or rich, you know, rich uncles and things like that. Um, and it continues to be, you know, it's continued over time over the other studies and stop acting rich and, and the millionaire mind to be approximately the same. So about 86 percent in the last. So it increased. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. all the yeah. all the all the critics out there who said, hey, it's because of the Internet boom, you know, the economy or they talked about survivorship bias and all the I mean, all you guys have to do is you do a Google search and you go look at forums. There are haters. How do you have a hate <laughs> of this book? But there are people. And I think like I said, it's a coping mechanism. But here's the one that blew my mind, and I bold faced it. This I, I don't remember reading this anywhere else, Sarah. So I don't know how you came across mm. this, and maybe you'll tell me. In 1892, <laughs> 1892, that my voice went high on purpose because right. I thought it was a typo. When no. I was at the show, I thought I was like, oh, no, he, he missed in, it by a hundred years. In this book, 1892, study of millionaires found that 84 percent were first generation affluent. That's not a typo, is it, Sarah? No, that's not a typo. You know, again, that came from some uh, research that my father had done and, um, you know, looking at uh, another author, again, that wasn't something that he he dreamed up. I think it was an article either in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. But, um, you know, they, they, again, this has been going on for a long time. I think what it also says, too, for, for those who have achieved wealth and that have succeeded and feel like they're there, that wow, you've got some work to do to make sure that that next generation, you know, is able to, to take the wealth that you may be giving to them in the future and, you know, doesn't squander it too. So, because again, if, if 80% or 86%, depending on the year, um, is first generation, it means there are some that have dropped off, if you will. Sure. Well, I think it's great because you have a unique skill set in the fact that you're a, you analyze data. I mean, it's your name of your company's data points. And then you're also <laughs> a psychologist. So, you know, you have to be both analytical but also understand EQ and all the other things that go into it. I think when I see a, a, a such consistency with data, when you see 80% in 1996, 86% in 2016, and then 84% all the way back to 1892, and these are coming from different sources. You know, you saying, Sarah, that this, your father had this, but it came from another, you know, article that he had read. This stuff starts to show to me, is there something to that? I sure. mean, when you have consistent, you start seeing trends. And, and that, that's, that's pretty valuable stuff. And that's what it, the big takeaway, and this is why you told us that, we, you know, when we started having this conversation and having you on, is, and I put it on here, you can do it. I mean, this is one of those things I want people to feel energized when they get off this and know. And you would put, you know, wealth isn't about being lucky, is it? I mean, is there, can you give us some, some thoughts on why is especially building wealth in America something that's not about luck? Yeah, you know, I, I think that um, again, we we've studied this from a um, st you know statistical psychological standpoint. There are certain behaviors that lead to net worth. So we know that if you are more frugal, if you are confident in your financial decisions that you're making. Um, if you can ignore, you know, what your neighbors just bought um, that's in their driveway, those things do actually predict net worth regardless of how old you are or your income level. So, um, you know, re just re regardless of where you are today, if you can implement those behaviors, uh, they, again, they, they allow you to, to be successful over time. Um, I have to read this because it has the name of our company in it. Oh. But actually, why, oh. you know, it's, it's page 49. I love this, Sarah. Quote, <laughs> economic opportunities continue to abound in this country, yet most Americans are not wealthy. It's easy to blame the so-called inequities in our economy, but it is more about the fact that Americans spend all or most of their income on things that have little or no lasting value, end quote. I just want to be like, <laughs> sick burn. It That's is. I mean, but, but it is. I mean, it, the simplest stuff. That's why when I read books about habits and other things, it's sometimes the simplest things. And, and, that, and that sentence says it all. And the fact of how do you prioritize and spend your money really does say a lot about it. And here's something I think is unique when we're comparing and contrasting to 1996 and now. And, and you know, 
social media. Mm, I mean, mm-hmm. wow. I mean, we've always had the saying of keeping up with the Joneses, didn't it? That, <laughs> that existed back in 1996. But, they, you know, nowhere— The Joneses didn't have Instagram back exactly. then. Exactly. No, they didn't. So mm-hmm. what is—I mean, any, any thoughts on what happens in modern society now with all these distractions and everything, Sarah, when you, from your research and, and when you're putting the book together? Yeah, absolutely. I think this one, this could, you could have a whole show on this one too. Um, you know, the, the influence now of what other people are doing is just, is always with us. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, if, if you are someone that uses social media a lot, that you're undoubtedly influenced by what you're seeing. Um, there, t- there's lots of studies out there already that are starting to look at the influence of, of constantly looking at what other people are doing and its influence on your own behavior. And we see that in the research we've done. So we know that individuals that are spending time on social media uh, tend to be those that have a harder time ignoring what's going on around them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also tend to be, you know, those that are st- struggling a little bit when it comes to building wealth. So I think, um, you know, being able to be disciplined and saying, hey, you know, this is this is something that's out there and people are putting their best foot forward. So I can't get caught up in what's going on there is, is a real um, is a real habit to start implementing today. If, if that's something that you're struggling with or you're feeling like you're left out because you weren't included on a, a you know, a vacation or didn't get a new car like this person did. Um, those are the kinds of things that, that can be you know, detrimental to, to you making good decisions in the future. Yeah, I mean, it is so powerful. I mean, it is amazing how much influence this stuff has. Um, it's not all rosy. I, I, I do want to bring up two things that you brought, but then I want to give some some money guy advice to our to our listeners. Mm. You, you had talked about healthcare and education. I mean, that there is that that those costs are going up significantly. Yep. Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, in particular, we talk about ed- education and and even what you were sharing earlier. You know, the idea that that you have to go to a traditional four-year school, that, that you have to follow the same path that other people are. Millionaires next door do things differently. I mean, they just always have. And so as education continues to increase, they're going to continue to do things a little differently. It may be, you know, um, a community college first and then, you know, a state school later once they're able to, to save up some money, those kinds of things. Um, and so that's, you know, again, just doing things differently is the hallmark of someone that is able to build wealth over time. Well, I'm always amazed. I mean, I, I find myself going down crazy dark, not dark, but <laughs> rabbit holes on YouTube. <laughs> dark made me sound like I'm doing something really creepy, but um, with my kids' filters on there, nothing like that's happening. But it is one of those things I watched a um, a pullover video. You know, everybody likes watching cop pullover videos. So it, it's like my weird habit. Yeah, and, um, everybody likes doing and that. And one right? of them that was this like sick burn was that there was this attorney that was pulled. He was driving an Uber and he was pulled over, but and then he was an attorney, so he he knew his. It, it was just kind of an interesting thing. And I, but the point of all this, I go way on tangents to say. That I'm shocked at how many people are side hustling these days. And is it, did, mm-hmm. didn't your research show that that is a pretty common thing? Um, yeah, you, yeah, de- definitely. We saw that, you know, again, we didn't ask that specifically in our surveys, but we've seen that. And and I think that there, that's some controversy. I think um, some individuals would say that those side hustles are because they, they have to and they can't make ends meet. And that is absolutely the case in a lot of um, environments and particularly for individuals that aren't, you know, making a certain level of income. Um, but for individuals that are, you know, kind of making a, an average level of income and, and really want to ensure that they're kind of doing this faster, um, they're, they're beginning their own, um, their own businesses. Again, it's so much easier today to do that. You yeah. can compare to 1996. I mean, you can sit in your basement and, and come up with a business idea and start it in an hour, <laughs> which now maybe it won't be successful, but you can certainly do it. Um, uh, and, and so I think that, you know, continuing to plan for the future to make sure that you're secure from a from an income standpoint, doing something that you, you love, even if it's on the side and in the evenings is, is important. You know, I'm hearing I'm hearing a common theme come from you, Sarah. And tell me if I'm hearing this correctly, that when it comes to being a millionaire, uh, you, I think you said it. I think this was your exact word. It's not about being lucky, but I even go so far as to say 
it's about making choices and participating in behaviors yeah. that purposefully put you in the direction towards millionaire status. It's not about letting yeah. life happen to you and participating passively in life. It's cognitively making some very specific decisions that move you towards that goal. Am I am I, I hearing that correctly? I think that's that's a great way to put it. I think that, you know, again, being aware of what's going on in your life, whether that's kind of where you're headed in your career or whether where your household is headed financially or even kind of the time that you're spending with your family and how that's being allocated. Um, and like you said, making some real decisions about where you're headed and, um, you know, proactively, you know, creating a plan to, to achieve the goals that you want to achieve or it's important. Well, kind of, I had a whole section of some interesting points I came across when I was going through your whole book, Sarah, but before <laughs> I kind of, cause I'm, I obviously need to cherry pick my list, but I wanted to give you the opportunity since you have been engrossed in this material. <laughs> I mean, is there, what's the biggest, most surprising or interesting things you kind of think that people would, would be surprised or, or find solace in or, you know, get a connection yeah. from? Yeah, you know, I think my my uh, my background and my research background is is in looking at kind of life experiences and kind of the things that impact you even from an early age. And so I think it's important to understand that a lot of millionaires have frugal parents. They have parents that are um, willing, and some of this comes in the book, and some of it's just from research we've been doing lately. Um, they have parents that are engaged in their career choices. They're asking them what they want to do instead of maybe telling them what they should do. Um, they are, they're teaching them, uh, good money behaviors, whether that's through, um, showing them, you know, we're going to sit down, we're going to talk about these things or they are, um, you know, they're exhibiting good behaviors. So, you know, when, when the neighbors have, uh, you know, brand new cars in their driveway, they're not going out the next day and, and getting something even better, you know, Reaction. I mean, that sounds silly, but that's, that's kind of what we're seeing. And I think that that, that theme has continued, um, throughout the research again, started by my father, but continuing today as well. Can, there are two things that I, that I find really striking about that, that I think is, that I think is interesting. Um, uh, you know, we mentioned that 80% of millionaires are first generation, 86% now, you know, fast forward to first generation. What's the thing that I always think in my head is why isn't that number higher? Because kids are making better decisions with money. People actually do have some inheritance. They have first generation parents who build wealth and they earn that. And so one thing that I think is going to be great is, uh, again, we have these live threads going on. A ton of folks, and, and this is the money guy show. So a lot of the folks who listen are successful. Maybe they have achieved that millionaire status. A lot of the questions that we're seeing come through are about raising responsible kids oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and making good decisions and, and you know touching on this economic outpatient care and how we oh, yeah. handle that. So I'm, just, I'm so excited to dive into that because I think that's a huge thing that once you do cross over that millionaire status, you know, it's hard to build up to that. But then how do you do that well when it comes to the second generation? That is the fear, I think, all parents who are doing well because you know it. And we tell this to our listeners, our clients, and everybody is make sure you – because your kids and your grandkids will have no trouble spending your money. Make sure you're, you're stealing <laughs> good money. Man. There's a reason that that number stays at 80 yeah. for 1996, 86 now, is that there is a cycle of life of wealth, is that it usually blows yep. through second and third generation. So, I mean, what? how do you answer that, though, Sarah? Is there some, some takeaways of some key points? I saw you had some case studies in there of people who are being very deliberate with their money management or skills that they're trying to teach the kids. What do you, do you mind sharing some of that with yeah, us? Yeah, definitely. So I think that, you know, the first piece is, uh, li like I said before, you know, looking at um, how you're modeling good behaviors to your kids. So if you are having them, for example, I think that was in the book, um, you know, they're responsible for their major purchases. They are responsible for, you know, having money come into their accounts and, and dealing with that. Um, you don't turn around and provide them with everything that they ask for. Um, you know, I, I think that that just starts a pattern of behavior early that, you know, again, by the time they're on their own, they're making those same decisions later when, when no one's around to tell them to do those things. Um, you know, we see the opposite a lot of times. Again, we there's not many opposite uh, examples in the book, but um, related to uh, parents that, you know, I, and again, we talk about the helicopter generation of parents sure. and, you know, are we giving too much? Are we doing too much? 
Um, and, and I think that that we are. We're we're not helping our kids by providing them with everything that they're asking for, and not having them work for it. Um, and, and so again, I think that some of those examples are are in in the book. But you know, a lot of them were you know, okay, my my child started his own little small little business i mean who what what kids now today right. have time to even start their own business sure. i mean you think about how busy everyone is um so those are some of the things that just to think about you know having them be responsible if they can't uh if they cannot you know generate their own revenue right because they can't they don't have time to work and things like that um, helping them understand the value of maybe what they're you're providing to them in terms of an allowance or something like that yeah, I mean, it, it, it's funny. We're recording another show yeah. after this about teenage yep. skill sets. Okay, I mean, yep. and, and it's funny, Sarah, I mean, because it's one of those things where if I could give you an idea for future research, if there was a way, because I think the problem with people, once you start building assets, you do want to invest because you're used to this concept of investing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not, not spending, but investing. So if the, like, you know, I think all, cause you see it in the behavior of grandparents investing in education, we're all taught that that's good, you know, to go save up and load up the grandkids, 529 accounts and stuff like that. But is there a, a, a no go and a go list of mm. good ways to spend money for, for successful children? And I don't know that, I've seen anything yeah, like that because it is that such a, and, but it's also, here's the nurture versus nature mm, is that, you mm-hmm. know, like Bo, you come from a very humble background sure. where, you mm. know, there were some struggles where you were even adopted yep. at, at, a, at a later age. And so, mm. so there's all kind of, by n- all statistical norms, you should not be anywhere near success. Sure. You, you yeah. shouldn't, mm. but somehow you're this, Mustard seed that just kind of right. rolled around until you finally found the fertile soil and became the man that you are. And that you hear those stories all the time. And that's why you wonder. And I don't know. I think it is definitely a combination of the nurture versus nature. They're both mm-hmm. working together. It's just what are the key points? It's just like me as a, as a 22-year-old finding your father's book and a light bulb goes off. And I think a lot... You just never know what the triggers are. Yeah, that's right. I, I mean, that's what I try to tell people is you've got to get your kids out there in front of stuff. You've got to challenge them. You've got to make sure they have a grace-filled, thankful heart, um, that they're humble. There's just so many things you want your kids, but, you you know, at the end of the day, you're just scared to death. Yeah. Because there's, the, <laughs> there's no man. You have kids too, Sarah, yep, so you yep. know what I'm talking about. I do. I do. And, um, yep. <clears throat> yep. You just Where hope you're it? not breaking them, you know, with every <laughs> right. decision you make. That's right. Um, I thought, you know, getting into the behavior of things, and we'll come back if there's any other parental things yeah, yeah. that we think of or we come across. I thought this was interesting when I was going through here of what was the best predictor of consumption. And, and there was three in this, in this post that was listed in the book was, um, which of the following three variables is the best predictor of consumption? Income, net worth, or market value of the home? So, mm-hmm. Bo, I mean, uh, you know, putting you on the uh, spot. I mean, did, which of those three do you think it is? Is the best predictor of consumption between income, net worth, or value of the home? Yeah. Well, uh, it's got to be one or three, right? It's, it's either income, so somebody who makes a lot of money likely could spend a lot of money. But then I think about this whole McMansion thing that well, we saw Well, it's all keeping happen. up with the Joneses. Yeah, and it, that's it, what, you know, people who choose to live, if you're the poorest person on your street, that is not a recipe for long-term success. Wouldn't you agree with that, Sarah? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think that that influence and that desire to sort of fit in is going to be really, really strong. And it's going to make you want to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade until you kind of match your your surroundings and the other folks around you. Absolutely. I even saw, and I'm yep. not trying to pick on this group, but I think they know that they're vulnerable to be picked on because we talked about dumb doctor deals. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Physician status. I mean, do you, because you, you actually use that term physician status. Is there, you know, is that tying in? I mean, do you see something where doctors have trouble with stereotypes and spending more than even some other professional categories? Yeah, you, you know, I, I think um, I'd say doctors, attorneys, um, individuals with those high, high incomes that are surrounded by other people with those high incomes that um, you know, that they want to fit into a certain kind of stereotype, even though they may not even say that or, or know it. But 
um, you know, I think that we talk about in the book, you know, the, the um, uh, financial advisor that needed to drive a certain kind of car because he felt like he had to show, you know, his clients a certain, you know, uh, way of living. Um, but I think that doctors and, and attorneys and other professionals are the same way. So, um, you know, you get out of med school and you're in residency and all of a sudden, you know, I need to have this kind of car. Everyone else has got it. So, you know, um, I think there, there are a lot of good resources now for doctors to, to learn more about what it really takes to build wealth. But, but certainly, you know, that, that continues to be a stereotype and it continues to be a hard one, particularly with the debt they end up taking, they often take on, sure. you know, going to med school and things like that. Um, you you brought up car buying, and I, I couldn't help because one of the <laughs> what how much when the you're when in the original mi- millionaire next door came out, all the sound bites that made like all the newspaper oh, yeah. articles was the most popular car driven by millionaire next door was the Ford F one fifty one fifty yeah yep, so yep. give us an update. I mean, what is what is the millionaire doing now in the in the, in, in twenty? Your data was as of twenty seventeen. What, right. what is that millionaire? Is it is it still an F one fifty or has it changed? Yeah. Yeah, Ford is number three, I think now. So um, it's you know Toyota and Honda tend to be the to okay. the the most popular. Um, and I think that that's that's kind of started with the millionaire or rather stop acting rich. So it's a couple of years ago that that sort of changed over. But um, you know, again, they're not driving luxury cars. So millionaires are not out there you know buying the fanciest car that's that's available. They're buying cars that are going to last for a while. Yeah. And you can see that in terms of you know how long and how how much they you know they keep their cars and things like that. So uh, again, just it's it's a big major consumption you know decision that you have to make. and uh, millionaires continue to to surprise us with that, I think, uh, quite frankly. Um, I, I'll tell a story of one of our clients because I don't think he'd mind me sharing because this was, <laughs> but it's um, he he talks about now realize he's 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 getting close to retirement in the next five years but he's been a, an insurance guy for years I mean decades had a very successful career and he talks about his first boss <laughs> made him told him to go out and buy a Lincoln Continental I realize mm-hmm. Lincoln back in the early eighties. Was probably was that's time. that's the that's the prime time car you know to go buy a Lincoln Town car, <laughs> and and the reason was that the, the, the his boss told him to do this is that if you go buy that car it will force you <laughs> you have to, to work to harder to oh and gosh, it will look right. good and I couldn't help but think about you as I was reading that because that you had that professional advisor who was saying that he felt like mm-hmm. you know he needed to drive something nice. Um, yep. You know, and he ended up doing, I think, a large SUV. That was kind of the compromise that was reached. But, and, and, but fortunately, I, I think his geography means l- less. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that stuff you don't see. And as you can see, we, it's not like we're wearing cufflinks. But what's funny <laughs> is that right. we get so many solicitation magazines. I don't know how we get on these lists. But my wife, even this morning, we, we're trying to fill up the recycling because we have these stacks of catalogs that come in the mail. And she was like, "Why did? How did you get on this? Because it was all tuxedos, <laughs> cufflinks." And I was like, "I don't know, but that's obviously not something I'm wearing." But um, no. um, I, I thought, what were the, what were some of the things in the book? There was a section talked about what a millionaire's rate as critical to mm-hmm. their su- success. Is there some mm-hmm. skill sets or, or talents or behaviors? What what does your research kind of show in the, that aspect? <laughs> Yeah, so you know, just similar to to the things that were found in '98. So that going back to the millionaire mind, that book, um, we we did the same study again. You know, in in 2016-17, and it the same factors like being disciplined and persevering. Um, uh, you know, and honesty and integrity that continues to be listed. Particularly, I think that you see that in in small business owners as well. Um, I think the spouse piece is really important. I think that, you know, going back to the idea that somebody has to manage your financial life and if you're not great at it, then somebody in your household probably needs to be, you know, you know, enlist their help. And and so that, you know, millionaires say that that's an important factor as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, working hard, it continues to be something that they, they say as well. I, I think that, um, as, as a group, individuals that are really good at transforming income into wealth are not, uh, not a lazy crew. They are, they're working hard and they're achieving their goals. That's, that's, that's awesome. And, and I was surprised to find, cause conversely, if we said what's not in there, mm, mm-hmm. you don't have to be a genius. 
Mm-hmm, right. Yeah. Th- this is this yeah. is what made me feel so good because I I will confess <laughs> to you guys. No, no, this is this is true because and I don't want any of my cl- prospects out there. You're like this guy. I can't believe he's confessing this stuff. Is that I was not what I call a front row sitter when uh, we're talking about is because I was an accounting major at Georgia. And I, I will tell you, my GPA was great before I got into accounting. Right. And then that was, right. mean, it was, it was a hard course yeah. load. I mean, it was something, but I was not a front row sitter. And, I, and it made me feel good. I, I guess if we're looking for coping mechanisms, we talked about the people who are naysayers to make themselves feel better. For me, it made me feel good to know I don't have to have a super high Q, IQ because that's not what the typical millionaire next door is. I mean, most of them, um, that, that's just not the way it works. Right. Yeah, I think that, whoops, I think that even the um, the idea that you can, you know, for example, financial literacy, like understanding how to manage your financial life, it doesn't seem to be as important as discipline and, and working hard and things like that. So that's, uh, we see that, you know, think about some of the the bosses that you may have had in the past. They might be really, really smart, but they might not be great at their job. Um, so I think that, again, if we're talking about managing our financial lives, Lives, it's it's more about those behaviors and less about you know how smart you are. Absolutely. Before I kind of cl- put a, uh, an exclamation point on this thing and close out the show, Sarah, is there anything if you want to kind of use this as a platform to kind of tell people a little bit more about what you know where they can find out more about you, more about the book? Um, what else do do you want to share with our audience today? Yeah. Thank you. You know, I think uh, we continue to do this research at Data Points. We continue to look at the factors and the the behaviors and the experiences and personality that helps individuals build wealth. So, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, we have a, a lot of uh, stuff on our blog. You can go to datapoints.com and learn more. Um, we're starting a couple of ser- uh, studies on looking at openness to making changes in your financial life. Mm-hmm. So if you go to datapoints.com slash learn, you can take one of our assessments and get a report. Um, and, you know, if you want to learn more about what it takes to be the next millionaire next door, we, we do outline quite a bit of, of behavioral uh, components in there, as well as update the, the data from the millionaire next door. So you can learn more about that at datapoints.com slash book. Yeah, and, and by the way, in the book, I mean, I know we just gave away tons of information. It really is a tip of the iceberg. Um, but it, and it's one of those things I thought the interesting thing if you, when you interview people who are successful, they mm-hmm. have reached that millionaire next door. They talked about how all the people you interviewed, they liked the additional flexibility, the opportunity to do things on their terms mm-hmm. is really yep. what financial independence brought them. Now, this is here's how I want to close this. I've got a quote from your book, and then I want to bring this full circle because I just I love doing the whole Jerry Seinfeld bringing the end to the front. But but listen, to this. here's the quote. You know you know how in a Seinfeld episode oh, yeah, they'll, they'll they totally bring it around. You're like, yes, oh, that's yes. so clever. But because um, this ties it back even to our successful habits show that we did mm-hmm. um, most recently. So so here's the, here's how the to kind of close things out. This is from you, Sarah, in your book. It said, "Quote: Building wealth requires a combination of our ability and willingness to live below our means, to be confident in our financial decision, and to ultimately take responsibility for the economic outcomes of our households. It requires us to." ignore the incessant barrage of what others are doing, driving, and wearing, and be forced enough to monitor what's going on in our own financial lives. And it takes being intentional about our financial path, creating goals and plans based upon how we want our lives to look, and then setting a course to meet those goals. We find it interesting that a recent economic forecast report from Vanguard, a report designed presumably to help traders make short or even medium-term trading decisions, ultimately concluded by informing the reader that the greatest impact on one's ability to build wealth over time is, and I bold-faced it, Sarah, (laughs) saving. Guys, that is the hardest part. I mean, if you can just do the behavior of saving and start early and do it often, You'll be tremendously successful. And then here's the full circle moment is I love this. As a matter of fact, I was so mad because I'd already read your book, but then I did the successful habits show notes, Sarah. And this was a, a lost opportunity on my part, but it does bring it full circle. Here's the way you started chapter one. You do on every chapter, you put a cool little quote. Oh, and yeah, I yeah. loved chapter one's quote because it was, 
believe it can be done, when you believe something can be done, really believe your mind will find the ways to do it. Believing yep. a solution paves the way to solution. Dave Schwartz, the magic of thinking big is the quote yep. you put in there. And here's what I think is interesting. What Bo and I talked about on the last full show we did on the successful habits is I told people that I'd been going to conferences for years mm -hmm with people saying, hey, write down your ideal client, and then I want you to go look at your existing client base and figure out where they fit in with that. I didn't do it. I was like, that's too simple. I don't need to go do that. It doesn't make sense. But mm. as soon as I went through the exercise, magical things started happening. And when I read this quote that you listed in your book, it really is true. If you will create a plan uh, you know, and know where you want to be, it's that whole covey, you know, begin with the end That's in mind, right. step two. It really is one of those traits that, guys, your brain wants to be successful. It's mm -hmm. just you have to write it down. You have to tell it, hey, we're turning this thing on, and we're going to align all the arrows in the same direction and be successful. You, you, know, a great, um, you know a great thing that you can do, a great way to get you moving in that direction. A great way to do that is to go out, get Sarah's book, read this so you know exactly what those next millionaires do. Uh, and as a reminder, we're going to give some away. Come to the Q&A after this. We're going to give some to the questions. Or even if you're listening to this not in live world, if you go out to moneyguy.com and subscribe, uh, we're going to be giving away a bunch of these over the next two weeks. Uh, random drawings. You'll just get an email from us, and then uh, you'll have a, a smiley package show up on your front door. So, guys, <laughs> hopefully you joined us on, for the live show. If you didn't, start tuning in because we, we plan on, you know, it's always fun. We give away stuff on our live shows. We also do a Q&A session at the end. And, and a special treat for everybody who stayed for the live, you know, as part of the live section. We're actually going to keep Sarah on and do a Q&A with Sarah but you can't get involved in that stuff unless you also just go to moneyguy.com. Give us your email address. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe, like us. You know, we, we, we need all the attention we can get because we're trying to grow this thing. But um, anything else, Sarah, you want to add? Because I think we're, we're about to close this thing out. No, this, is, this was great. Thanks for having me on. I love talking about this stuff and, and love hearing your perspective and the history with the book too, Brian. So yeah. thank you. Well, and that's why it's really been a passion of mine. You know, a lot of times we, as y'all, as our audience knows, we don't do a lot of affiliate stuff. We don't do paid posts. Sarah, you didn't pay to come on this show. There's no endorsements <laughs> no. or anything. I just really love this type of research. I think this is the work that people need to know because there's so many voices out there telling you you can't do it. So when you see something that does just the opposite and actually gives you data, I mean real living data, and it's consistent data over the decades, it starts to make you realize, hey, there's something to this. Maybe the majority of people just haven't figured out that special right. recipe. I want you guys out there in the Money Guy family to be successful, make this happen. So thanks so much, guys. I'm your host, Brian Preston, with Mr. Bo Hansen.